Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, hello and welcome. Um, today we'll be doing our, our Mastery of Money seminar. And what we'll be doing is basically looking at esoteric concepts to allow you to get the money that you want in life. Not necessarily to become millionaires or to become very, very wealthy, but to have enough money to go through the physical plane, to buy those experiences that you need for yourself and for your loved ones, and to feel a sense of it all just coming to you naturally as an outpouring of the love and the creativity that you put out, rather than this whole concept of like working hard and struggling and forcing the whole thing to come about for you. Basically speaking, the way that I handle esoteric money is I teach people to raise their energy. I teach you to become more life force, more power. And then when you do that, people will be pulled to you. People will show up. They're going to crawl over the walls and under the doors, and they're going to lower themselves in through the ceiling, and they'll, they will be there. And when they show up, what you have to do is bill them. You have to have a way of billing these people so that you can basically make money. And that means being organized, having a product or a service or something that you can give to these people when they show up in your life. For them, for you to raise your energy and have all these people show up and then you haven't got a way of working it with them, you won't have the abundance, you won't have the creativity, and you won't have an energy pattern that will go all the way. And basically, some of you are going to need lots of money. You're going to need loads and loads of the stuff in order for you to buy those experiences and to create the changes that you hope for yourself. When you look at the physical plane, you can understand that it isn't designed for people to be rich. If we divided all the wealth up in the world among all of the people, okay, in fact, everybody would be millionaires. But the system is so designed that a few people have the wealth, and the rest of the people do not have the wealth. And because it is designed like that, and because it's come down from thousands and thousands of years, the common man has to put in a certain amount of transcendent energy to pull himself or herself out of a system that isn't designed to assist you. I mean, imagine if you could go to work and in one week you could earn, let's say, $2 million. And you think, oh, Friday, I think I'll retire from here on out. The system isn't designed like that. But the way that the system is designed is that if you work really, really hard, it will spit out just enough cash to keep you just above what I call the revolution level. You know, where you're not out in the street tearing the system apart, but they fed you just enough to keep you going so that you don't blow away the system. The world that we live in is just owned by a few people. You know, let's say 500, 1,000 families own the entire world, okay? And they also own the governments, they own the societies, they own the banking systems, they own all the financial institutions, they dictate what interest you'll pay, how much rent you'll pay, what mortgage terms you will receive, you know, what your car payments are. They decide everything for you. And they also decide how much money the average man in the street will have. And if you are, let's say, a, a small businessman and you've opened a business, you're going to open it in that kind of energy pattern, in an energy pattern of control, restriction, keep everybody bottled down, give them a little bit so they don't revolt, but don't give them too much because we don't want these people coming up out of the pack, becoming too self-empowered and starting to take away the, the, the control that the big people have. And so as you look at that, if you open a business and you're this small businessman and you've got a creative idea, you can only earn money from the energy of those people around you. And if all of those people are like close to starvation or just making it through or just squeaking through, how much disposable income have they got to buy your product? And so we're all affected, whether we're independent business people or whether we work for one of the big institutions or we work for the system, we're all basically affected by, by the fact that the whole thing is not designed for the common man. And you've heard me say that many, many times in this seminar and in other seminars, that the world is not designed for the people. It's designed to keep the institutions up. It's designed to keep the philosophies up. It's designed to support the governments. And you, as the ordinary working people, are always sent the bill. You, you get to pay for everything. If there's a mistake, you get to pay for it. You know, if there's some kind of disaster, you pay for it. And as you look at that, you can understand that the only way that you can pull out of those feelings and out of this conditioning that basically is absolutely designed to hold you down is by you having a force of will that is stronger than the force of will that is trying to control you. And you have to create inside of you an energy pattern a bit like, well, imagine if you were like swimming along in a swimming pool. And you're, you're down at the bottom of the swimming pool and you're holding your breath and like swamp thing like grabs you by the ankle, you know? How much would you want to swim to the surface? 
You know, how much effort would you put into getting up and getting out of that and getting a breath of air? And for some of us, that's how much effort we have to put into becoming financially independent, mastering money. Because our societies do not teach us power. They teach us that we are weak, that we have guilt, that we're useless, that we're supposed to support everything else, we're supposed to send money to everything else, that none of us is really for us, and that if we do too well, somehow that pulls us away from being godly or righteous or good. And of course, that's a bunch of hooey, because the life force or the God force is absolutely abundant. It'll give you anything that you believe in and more. You only have to look at nature. You can look at a cherry tree or an apricot tree, and it has more apricots on there than you can ever eat. It has more cherries on it than you can eat. You know, and when you look at it, it has that splendid abundance naturally. You know, if a man dis designed an apricot tree, it would have like two itty-bitty apricots at the top of the tree, and they'd be out of reach, and they'd be a little stale, and you'd have to have permission to go climb it, and a certificate for when you got it, and then a third of the apricot would then belong to somebody else, and eventually you'd wind up with just a pit and a little bit of apricot, you know? And that's how the system is designed. When you look at it, when you look at the physical plane, we are here as these transcendent beings, as these infinite beings inside a body, and you have the ability through your thought forms and through your feelings to absolutely redirect and change your life. I believe that you're not your body, that you're not your mind, that you're not your sexuality, that you're an infinite being inside a body, and that you took on the limitations of the physical plane in order for you to be able to transcend them. The physical plane, the humans that are on this physical plane, are basically like in a circle. And the circle is created by the electromagnetic waves of the brain that set up this field or this force field that we all live in. And that force field cuts us off from the abundance of the life force. It cuts us off from the God force. It cuts us off from other dimensions of existence and makes us or gives us the illusion that what we see is real. But in fact, the physical plane that you see is no more solid than your thought forms. There's no more solid than, than, than the feelings that you have within you. The fact that the physical plane is moving at the speed of light gives it the illusion of being solid. But in fact, you're looking at basically a non-solid world, a world of thought form of consciousness. Your body being the same thing, your feelings and your thought forms all being different and varied forms of the one and the same energy. And as you look at the way scientific research is going now, you can see that the scientists are getting nearer and nearer and nearer to a unified force field theory where all energy will be just one and the same energy. And that's my feeling, and that's the sort of mystical or metaphysical approach. I believe that as an individual, you can be in this circle of activity that describes the physical plane, and you can scratch, and you can hollow, and you can thump and scream and rip people off and compete with them and shove and push, and you can become wealthy. You can drag yourself out of the programming, out of the circumstances. But my way is I feel more fluid and simpler, and that's basically to work upon your intentions, to work upon your concentration, and to move into a pattern that allows allows wealth to come to you naturally. Because the other system where you're sort of scratching and biting to get money, it's almost like your wealth means somebody else's poverty. Where my way is, you can become wealthy and then allow everybody else through your wealth to become even richer. It's not like there's any limit to how much is out there. And it's not like there's any limit to how much money you can have. There are millions and millions of dollars every day that are lost and left lying around and people die and they just leave it in little sort of carrier bags someplace. You know, there's millions of opportunities for cash at no effort at all. And it's not like you, you becoming wealthy is going to detract from somebody else at all. Because we're not living in a finite world. We're not living in a world that only has this much resources or this much wealth. There are more resources to be discovered. There are more creative ways of doing things. There's always an ever-expanding amount of wealth. And what you're doing as an individual is, you're saying, listen, I'm happy to concentrate on making money because I understand that if I don't concentrate on making money, I won't have anything. You know, if you concentrate on the phantom rapist, the phantom rapist comes out of the woodwork and bites you on the bum. If you, if you concentrate on money, you get money. But of course, the societies and the way we teach our children disengages them from money. It disengages them from having wealth because we teach our kids, hey, it's not okay to be wealthy. You know, the meek will inherit the earth. The God force doesn't want you to be wealthy. It just wants you to be this little thing and being terribly poor and being terribly thankful for the little itty bitty that you got, you know. But of course, that's not true. That's just a load of hogwash that was handed down over thousands of years. You know, the life force could give a damn how much money you have or don't have. It is not emotionally involved in whether you're okay or not okay. Welcome, dear one. I've been eagerly awaiting your arrival. You see, the divine journey that brought you to the... 
If you're doing splendidly, then your splendidness will help others because you'll be doing economic things, creative ideas, you'll be spending your money hiring people. You know, you're helping the world by becoming powerful. And yet we look at a physical plane where everything is designed to not allow us to become powerful. As you come into the physical plane, as soon as you're born, or some people would say even before you're born, that mind of yours is beginning to record every feeling, every event, everything that's ever been said to you. And you suck all of that up. You know, you can put a person in a hypnotic trance and you can take them back to when they were 11 years old, to their birthday party or something like that. And you can have them tell you how many people were there, what their names were, how many cans of, of Coke they drank, how many packets of Jello was eaten, who did what. You, everything is in your life. Everything is all there. How many steps you took from the parking lot to your seat right now, you have a memory of all of that. And you imagine this small babe, and it's lying there, and it's sucking in all this information. Okay, and it's born to parents who think that, like, working hard is honorable, that you have to work hard to make it through the physical plane, you know. Well, let me ask you a question. How many of you here thinking that, like, think that, like, you have to work hard to make money, or you've been taught that you have to work hard to make money? Let me see your hands. Okay. You see, they sold you that. They sold you that. The people that run this circle of activity, okay, sold you that because they wanted you to work for them. You know, they wanted you to work hard for them. Okay? And so basically speaking, we, we buy into that. Working hard is honorable or working hard is how you make money. Making money has nothing to do with working hard. It's nothing to do with effort or struggle. It's mostly a matter of being balanced and organized. And as you begin to center on your creativity, people show up that want to be a part of that creativity, want to be a part of that action. They feel your security, your strength, and they sign up for it and they pay you for it. So it's a simple transference of energy. You transfer them an idea and they transfer you another idea called money. As you look at that, you understand that like this small child inside this body, it begins to suck in all of these belief patterns and it has no volition of, you know, as to what is going to go in there. You know, whatever goes in there is whatever goes in there. So if the mom and dad are fighting over the rent, that's in your subconscious mind. You know, if your mother's into sort of saving and clipping little coupons and there's a big stack of them in the kitchen, again, that's in your mind. Save coupons. There isn't going to be enough to eat. You know, you know, reserve this. You know, eat the leftovers. You know, do this and do that. And I'm not saying you've got to waste stuff as you go through the physical plane because I don't really agree with that either. But we take on whatever our mom and dad or our father and our mother thought. And, of course, so many of our... Our fathers and mothers came out of a generation when there was a depression, when there was a great amount of difficulty. And so they're not able to express a more transcendent, more fluid understanding of money. Today we live in the largest and most fast-moving capitalist society in the world. And there's, there's, there's millions, there's billions that are moving around at any one given moment. And yet here is this mind that takes on all this sort of stitch in time, saved nine, and a penny saved is a penny earned. And we take on that mentality. And then we wonder when, as we go out, out into the physical plane as young adults or, or, or as teenagers or we go out into the workforce, we begin to resonate that into the, into the life force and the life force or the energy that the force field that we're in reflects back to us exactly what we believe, exactly what we, 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 we put out there and it gives us back struggle. It gives us back there's not enough. It gives us back, you know, work for no wages, save your money in case something dreadful happens, do this and, and defend that and, and, you know, and if people don't like this or don't like that, sue them for the money or go chase them for the money. But, but you know, there isn't enough. And that whole energy of, of like there not being enough and there isn't going to be enough for you to get through is sold to you as a way of disenfranchising and controlling you. Inside this circle, everybody believes life to be real. And the circle is created, as I said, by this electromagnetic energy that leaves your body, which I believe is created by the oscillation of the brain waves. And so as we look in this physical plane, we're looking at a physical plane that deals totally with manipulation, totally with restriction, and totally making sure that you don't come out of the pack, okay? As you're going through the physical plane, you're taking in everything that you hear, everything that you feel, everything that's ever said to you, and you're also taking in all the rest of the energy. You're taking in energy subliminally. You're taking energy in below your threshold of consciousness that you don't, are not even aware that you're taking it in. And we know from the subliminal tapes that we sell through our catalogs and so on that the, that, that the mind has an ability to hear affirmations that are placed 40 decibels below regular earshot. And so we have a track of music that rides up and down, you know, getting louder and softer. And underneath this track of mu music is a loop tape that runs these very powerful affirmations that are designed to create behavioral change. And as that loop, or as that loop rides up and down with the music, it stays 40 decibels at all times below the music, below the earshot. 
And we know from our research and the research that's been done in various universities in the United States that the inner mind hears that and accepts it. And yet think of you, you know, you're just going through life and how many sounds and how many feelings and how many opinions are you a part of that are very debilitating, that are very weakening, that you may not have chosen, but that became a part of your mind, you know? Like you'd be at the supermarket and like somebody in two, two, you know, two lines or two aisles further over to the right might sort of pick up a can of beans and go, oh, look at the price of those beans, the world's falling apart, bong. And that would enter your mind if it was 40 decibels below your regular earshot. <laughs> So you're a product of not only what society has told you you can't have, not only what your parents told you you couldn't have, but you're also a product of all the thoughts and feelings of the people around you. You can't sit next to somebody in an audience like this and not pick up whatever they are. Their feelings are booming out and they're pervading your feelings, okay? And uh, if you want to change your seat in the break, feel free, you know? <laughs> but basically speaking, you're it. If a person touches you, there's an energy transfer. If they look at you, there's an energy transfer. And so can you imagine this young being that's coming into the physical plane who doesn't have, an, have a necessarily any experience of how to do it and being debilitated with all of this stuff and then going out, putting that energy into the universal law and getting back exactly what they put in and they put in for struggle and difficulty and hard work and lack and not enough and the universal law gives them back that stuff and then they can say, you see, life's really hard, okay? And each one of us came out of that same product. So for you to get out of that energy pattern, you have to push against it. You have to literally force yourself to allow yourself to be in control of the money that you make and to master the money. And the mastery of money for me is, as I said, not necessarily becoming very, very wealthy, but being in control. So you spend less than you earn and you earn enough to buy yourself all the experiences that you're ever going to want on the physical plane. When you think about it, you create a creativity, you create a product or an idea, it's energy, it comes from consciousness. Then you take it out to the people, they respond to it positively, and they give you money, which again is energy. Money is neither good nor bad. You know, the folk that said that money is the root of all evil or the love of money is the root of all evil, they, they just didn't have any. Because you've got to have money to get through the physical plane. You know, you've got to have it. And of course, what happened was that we were taught that somehow money and spirituality didn't mix. And yet when you meet a person that is truly spiritual, they'll have a lot of energy, and so automatically they'll have a lot of money. In the olden days, let's say in 500 BC or something like that, it was fine for a person to withdraw and to go up on the mountain and sit under the banyan tree or whatever they wanted to sit under, and to pull away from the commerce of things and to contemplate upon, you know, the light of God or whatever it is they wanted to do. But you didn't, you, you, know, you weren't born there. Or if you were, you know, right now you're here, you're in commerce, you're in travel, you're in making things happen. It's a totally different society. And I feel you could transcend by pulling out and sitting up on a mountaintop. But once you had the power, you would have to come back down into the physical plane and do something with it. And so the philosophies that came out of poverty and seeing it as beautiful and seeing it as righteous came out of a time when there wasn't anything to do. You know, Buddha couldn't turn on the video and watch a couple of videos and play his CD player. He only had sitting under the, under the tree. You know, sitting under the Bodhi tree was the only game in town. So that's what he did, you know. And, but we're not in that time. We're action-oriented, we've got things to do, there's people you've got to meet, there's things you've got to build and create, there's, there's children that have to be brought up and developed into strong and powerful human beings, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for individuals that are prepared to push against the system without confronting it, because the system will never look after you. You know, it's not designed to. And if you look at the history of man, all the governments have let all the people down all of the time, you know? And if you don't believe that, you don't know anything about history. You know, you might want to repeat it after me. All of the governments let all of the people down all of the time. Because basically speaking, governments are individuals that are looking after their own interest. You know, they're looking after their own power unit. They're looking after their own election. They're not worried about whether you're making your mortgage payment, you know, in downtown Arkansas. They could give a damn, you know. They are just worried about their own position. And they get to play the game, and they get to spend your cash, and then they send you, as I've said before, this love letter called a tax bill that you have to pay for their creativity. They don't actually create any wealth of themselves. The wealth of the nation is the individual man, the individual female, the working people of the country. We create the wealth, and they just get to play with it. You know, and the way they play with it is they get to spend it pretty much any way they like. They get to bill you any time they want to bill you. And if they run out, they just print some more. 
And so we're looking at a situation where the whole of the circle, the whole of the people that control this circle, the families that run the world, they have a control of the money. And money to the common man is life force. It's God force to a guy that doesn't have a spiritual quest, a person that doesn't have a quest or doesn't have a belief in any kind of higher transcendence. Those people that are purely in the physical. If you're a coach without a diary full of high quality clients that want to pay you and want to work with you, you are obviously physical plane, money is their God force. And once these people got control of the money, they could control the life force for the world. And then they could control the destiny of the world. And there's none of you here that haven't been controlled by the big families that run the world. Because they decide everything, from the price you pay for a shirt to how much you pay to go to the movies. Everything is decided, and the whole system is designed not for you not to come out of the pack. And as long as you remember that, now you can push against it and you can say, gosh, that's dreadful, you know, that's awful. Why have they designed it like that? They designed it because they're into control. They're into making sure that none of us ever get out, okay? And you can push and you can rant and rave and you can have your little placard and you can go down to D.C. and stand there in front of the White House and it won't do anything for you. The only way you can win your freedom is to have enough cash to pull out, okay? And to disengage somewhat from the feelings of the world, from the emotions of the world, so it isn't controlling you. Okay, and that to me, I think, is incredibly important because you've been sold this bill of goods that says you can't have it, and then the whole thing is designed, and if any of you do too well, they take the money back from you. All the money you have is basically on rental. You don't have any wealth of your own. I mean, look, for example, in property taxes, okay? They take, let's say, 1% or 1.5% of that property from you every year, okay? And governments go on for hundreds of years, so they can wait to get the house back from you. But they take, let's say, 1% a year. In one generation, they've got a quarter of your house. They didn't do anything for it. They never paid you. I mean, nothing happened. They just took a quarter of your house back. In two generations, they got half the house. In four generations, they'll own all of the real estate of the country. And that's how property taxes work. You know, so you think they've got your interest at heart? No, they just chip in a little bit of your income back, and they time it or they place it so that it's like this creeping thing that you're never really quite aware of. You know, and then suddenly you think, my goodness me, I've given 9% of my house back to these people. Why did I do that? You know, well, you did it because they passed the law saying you had to do it and you don't have options. I believe in obeying the laws, but I also believe that you can design your life to take maximum fluidity within the law. You know, within the tax structure, within all of the things that you are allowed to do, that the sort of, the people that control this circle allow you a certain amount of modicum of, of, of like elbow room, and then you use that in order to become powerful. And so as you look at that, you can see that for you to, to become powerful, to have enough money, you have to begin, first of all, to look at what's stopping you getting money. You know, what are these feelings inside of me that don't allow me to be wealthy? Because for you to be wealthy and to become wealthy and to have people show up and they want to share their wealth with you, because there's only one place that you can get money, and that's from the other people in the physical plane, because we're the only people that believe in that stuff, okay? You can't get it from any place else other than the other mugs in the game with us. And so we have this energy that's absolutely neutral, and you have to create an energy from within yourself and then get these people to come along and give you the cash. To do that, you have to look at, hey, what do I really feel? You know, what do I really feel about money? And when you look at how we deal with money, you can see that, like, for example, you, you may have had feelings. I know I certainly did. I remember thinking that if I became too successful financially, somehow it would pull me out of the society that I lived in, you know? Like, if I do too well, I might have to leave this ghetto, you know, that kind of feeling, you know? Or if I do too well, all my friends won't like me anymore, you know? Or if I do too well, it may not be as loving or as strong as, as God might want for me, you know? Because I, I bought into the fact that God wanted me to be poor, you know? And so as you look at that, you can see that, like, we have hundreds of these limitations. I mean, thousands of them. You know, stitching time saves nine. You know, there's one. You know, what does that mean, for goodness sake, you know? If the thing tears, chuck it away and buy another one. What are you doing all the stitching for? I mean, who's got time to do <laughs> stitching and stuff, you know? Oh, stitch. You know, I mean, you get another. It's as simple as that. But we buy that. We buy, for example, things like women are no good at figures, you know? Like they're no good at mathematics. That means that somehow or other they're not going to make so much money. And, of course, women are, are just as good as anybody else with mathematics. You only need an $8 calculator. You can work it up, up to $10 billion, you know? And, and <laughs> And, I, and I, I do a lot of business with females, and we, we travel all over the world, and we use a lot of um, feminine talent in, in various areas, and they know how to charge, and you know, they know how to make it work. I mean, it's simple. It's like, well, here's $1,000, lady, and here's $20,000. Which would you like to have, you know? I mean, it's obvious. You don't have to be brilliant to figure that one out. And so, you know, we, we buy that stuff. We buy that stuff. 
We buy like getting inside the little circle, getting in the corporation, and taking what they eke out for us, you know. There are other types of limitations that deal with like religious beliefs, you know, where you, if you're not, you know, you're not holy if you're rich or, or that kind of thing. And then, of course, we have all the limitations that deal with, well, if I do too well, you know, nobody will like me. If I do too well, it'll be such a responsibility looking after all this cash. You know, how the heck am I going to figure out what to do with all of this money? You know, if, if, I, if I do too well, you know, it will cause me problems. I'll have all these responsibilities. I'll have to defend it and so on. And we buy that stuff. Philosophical limitations about your relationship to money. You know, spiritual you know, limitations of one kind or another. Sexual limitations. You know, maybe if you're a minority, you may feel that in this society, you don't have the ability to, to, to do as well as the people that are in the majority. Like as if the God force of the money knows what the color of your skin is, you know, and thinks, oh, I'm going to give this guy a hard time because he's different or something like that. And as you look at that, you can see that all of the people out there in a society or in a circle that is not, is not designed for them to do well with anyway, and all of the belief patterns they've got and all of the limitations, you can see that, like, you can understand why the people aren't rich, you know, why they never make any cash. Let me ask you for one or two of, like, those standard limitations that we're all a part of, those, those limitations that are so much a part of our culture. Perhaps you, you might like to kind of wander around and, and get a pick up a few for me. Great. Uh, see what this one my mum always used to say, you've got to save for a rainy day. Absolutely. And if you save for a rainy day, of course it rains, you know, it has to. Because that energy of putting in the, um, the negativity pulls to you the rainy day. You know, the very fact that you believe you're going to be a part of a disaster means the disaster will happen. And if you put a whole bunch of dry food in a hole in the ground, you know, because of that energy of defending yourself, you mount two machine guns on the roof, you put your granny there defending the house, defending the street, then what happens is that that energy pulls to you the disaster because of the negativity that you're putting out. And if you put this dry food in the, in the ground, something will happen and this moose will come along and it'll do itself on its food, on your food, and there goes your stash or there goes your stock. You know? Let me ask you for some others. If you have, it, if you have any money, don't tell anybody. Yeah, if you, don't, if you have any money, don't tell anybody because some reason or other that's going to either make them angry or jealous or they're going to come around and try to take it from you. Of course, that's a lot of nonsense. If you're, if you're wealthy, you just feel wealthy. I, don't, I think you don't want to be brash about your wealth and sort of showy or too showy, but you've got to spend it. There's absolutely no point in having money if you don't get rid of it. The whole point of it is to keep it moving and keep it flowing. Money, of course, is like manure. If you pile it all up in one place, it stinks. If you spread it around, it makes things grow. <laughs> right? <laughs> Let's have another one. It's easier to get a camel through the eye of a needle, then the rich man into heaven. Right, that's a standard one. And of course, the eye of the needle, I believe, was it not the, um, the gate of Jerusalem? And to get a camel through the gate of Jerusalem wasn't a big deal. And if the camel was a bit stubborn, you just had the camel over here, and you take a bucket full of the camel's, camel's lunch, and you put it on the other side of the gate, and you go, hither, hither, camel, and it comes along. Because that's how they talk in biblical times, hither, hither. <laughs> and, uh, and the camel just automatically walks through the gate. And of course, a lot of our philosophies were designed to make sure that nobody got wealthy. You know, you can imagine how, like, well, imagine in medieval times when, say, for example, a lot of the churches owned all of the land, I mean, thousands and thousands of acres of land, you know, and the common people were dying of starvation, living ten in a room in squalid, filthy conditions. From time to time, they'd go up to the, you know, the sort of the big monastery or something, and they'd bang on the door, and they'd say, Oi, what about us, you know? What do we get? And, of course, those people who owned or controlled the circle in their day, you know, they weren't about to share it with everybody. They weren't about to say, well, look, we'll peel you off five acres in the North 40. And so they had to sort of say, well, you'll get yours later. You know, you'll get yours in the afterlife. You know, you know this poverty stuff's really cute, and you're loving it right now because later on you're going to get it. And, of course, now we're not so stupid, you know. We're a little bit more sophisticated. We aren't going to buy into that afterlife stuff, not because I don't believe in an afterlife, but I want my power now. I want my experience is now where I can experience them and become a part of them and that's what you want you don't want a promise for later and of course the mind and the ego will always accept a promise you know you, you can always tell somebody yeah, I'll do it for you but later and the mind goes oh that's okay later later and that's how the, and that's why that philosophy was so powerful and so useful to to the people that ran the situation in those days because they could promise people a later date you know a long-term delivery what about being filthy rich 
Yes, like as if rich and uh, rich is somehow dirty. And isn't it true how like for a lot of people, money, money has equates with like the misuse of it. You know, like if you're rich, you're bound to be misusing it. And of course, there's nothing, it's nothing to do with that. You know, you can have money and be loving and generous and kind and, and to help the world, you know. But isn't it interesting that we equate wealth with like some kind of misdemeanor or not acting honorably? And of course, that's not necessarily the case at all. Any others, you? Money corrupts. Money corrupts. Yes. And of course, a lot of times it does because money is power now. I don't know about you, but when I look at an empty bank account, I feel hopeless. In our physical plane. And power is very, very hard to work with. And the whole point of experiencing power is, in a way, to misuse it. You know, because that's the only way you really get to learn about it. But, but in the corruption is also the healing and the transcendence. And I think that's pretty important, you know. Yeah, give us this day our daily bread like there isn't going to be enough. Okay? Like this little bit's coming up. It's like welfare. <laughs> Here's your little welfare. Any others? Money can't buy your love. Yes, money can't buy your love. But in fact, yes, it can, okay, definitely. But the fact is, of course, that the way you get love is to express love, you know, and it's nothing to do with money. It's absolutely nothing to do with money. In fact, and money can buy your love, push to shove. But basically speaking, it's only a matter of expressing a loving attitude and love will come to you anyway. Any others? Yes. Uh, can we have a positive one? Money makes the world go round. Money makes the world go round. And of course it doesn't. The world spins automatically of its own. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, save for emergencies. Okay, that's, that's the same thing as was said before, where you're waiting for the emergency to come. Beautiful people are rich. Sorry, I've got more than one coming at once now. Yes. Only beautiful people are rich. Only beautiful people are rich. That's not so true. I know a lot of ugly millionaires. <laughs> yeah. But you see how all of that stuff became so important, you know, and all of that stuff became a part of our culture and a part of the way that we, that we, that we treat money. And of course, what you have to do now is to begin to resonate a powerful intention for your whole trip about money. Because when a person permeates that negativity or that weakness inside of you, because it is already there in your mind, there has to be an acceptance. You know, you have to accept that. If you're standing next to somebody in a supermarket and they're pro they projecting lack, if you have lack inside your mind, you actually enhance or increase the lack that you have. Okay, the only way you can come out of power is to not have it in your mind or to have this forward projection of energy, this expanding energy that feels, yes, I can. Yes, I will. I have it all around me. This is a flowing situation and there's no problem with the amount of money that's going to come to me in my life. When you resonate your feelings, they change moment by moment as to what you feel about yourself. If you feel negative, you begin to create inside of you a feeling that pulls energy to it in a kind of imploding or coming in parabola of energy or curve of energy. And negativity has a way of resonating, so it sucks other feelings towards it. So if you're negative, you'll pull to you somebody else that is equally negative. If you're negative, you'll pull to yourself energy patterns that are disastrous or tend to fall about. And at the top of the curve, you know, it's just little niggly things that go wrong. You know, the car won't start, and this happens, and the handle comes off the bathroom door, that kind of stuff. But then bit by bit, as you begin to resonate the negativity after a long period of time, then suddenly the whole energy pattern begins to break up around you, and the whole thing drops on your head and collapses on top of you. You know, whether it's a financial collapse, or whether it's a collapse of your physical body, or collapse of a relationship, or some situation, it's because through the negativity, you pull that to you. And by pulling it to you, you suck from the physical plane and you suck only those parts that are congruent to you. If you imagine yourself walking along in this bubble of energy, okay, all of life is coming at you at the speed of light. And it's coming at you upside down, okay, at the speed of light. And you have all of these possibilities coming at you at any one given moment, okay. And you will pull from those feelings that are the same as your feelings, that are congruent with your feelings. So all the goodness in the world is coming at you, and all the evil is coming at you. And then you can pick up whatever you want. And so you kind of filter through your own feelings those experiences that are exactly the same as what you feel. And so as you maintain and establish a negative energy pattern, or a pattern of limitation or lack, it begins to pull in on you, and it pulls from the physical plane all of those things that are exactly the same. 
The only way to defend yourself against that, the only way to really develop a power inside of yourself, is for you to begin to pull out of you this transcendent, infinite, abundant feeling from within you. When you express positively, it creates an outgoing or exploding curve of energy. It's like this, this outgoing feeling. Not only is it warm, is it fresh, is it loving, but it inspires people because it's pure life force. It's pure confidence. And it's not, like, it's not like sort of confidence that you wear on your sleeve, which is real sort of pushy type of confidence, but it's basically confidence of feeling everything's okay. And as you resonate that energy outwards, the more and more power that you put out into the world, the more you allow that infinity and that abundance to come from your feelings, the less the negativity of the other people pulls you down. Because you cannot walk in a crowd of people, say in a supermarket or in a shopping mall, without having all of those people affect you. And you've all experienced it, where you've got out of a car and you've walked into a mall and you've only walked like maybe 100 yards or 200 yards and you bought like a can of something and you walk back to your car and you're absolutely exhausted. You know, have you had that experience? Right. And it's because what happens is as you walk through that mall, your feelings are resonating around you and everybody else is literally taking a bit of that energy from you. Every time they have eye contact with you, every time they touch you, every time they pass you, a part of you leaves with them. Unless you're resonating this everlasting supply from within yourself and resonating it powerfully and, and strongly, then what happens is you get it into the habit of holding your energy, holding that power to yourself. And it's the same way, again, with money. If you feel confident about it, it begins to be there. It's like natural. But you can't come from like way down here in a state of, let's say, limitation and poverty to something up here where you're walking, walking with or a part of absolute abundance. You know, if you resonate poor feelings, you have to stay poor because universal law has got to reflect that. And so the name of the game as you begin to master money is one, allow yourself the patience to go beyond the old stuff, the old garbage, and two, begin to resonate in your feelings the abundance that you're a part of. And here you have to be very, very careful because a lot of people begin to think, oh yeah, all I've got to do is act abundant, act powerfully, act transcendent, you know, buy a lot of stuff, buy a lot of fancy clothes, and abundance will come to me. In fact, what you've got to do is you've got to begin to see abundance in those things that you actually have. Okay? It's not a matter of like going out and spending a lot of money on French clothes or something and then being in debt because that very fact that you're in a debt is going to pull you backwards. It's more like saying, okay, around me I have this and I see beauty and abundance in it. And then as you begin to become more and more confident and you have more and more surplus income, you can begin to create affirmations of abundance in your feelings that actually affirm, hey, I'm doing fine. I'm doing well. And so, yes, go out and buy a good suit. Go out and buy a fine dress, a fine pair of shoes, whatever it is, you know? And have one, but have one of the very, very best quality. If you go for the cheap and the cheerful and the discount, it it's always has that energy. You know, a discount, say, vacuum cleaner has a discount vacuum cleaner's energy. And I remember my wife once buying this, this, this vacuum cleaner which was at a used machinery shop, you know, one of those places where they sell used appliances. And she was all proud of herself because she'd got this thing for $15. And she wheels in this vacuum cleaner and it looked like a $15 vacuum cleaner, you know. In fact, to me, it looked like she'd been ripped off at $15. And she plugs it in and there's this limp little bag hanging on the back of this thing, you know. I mean, it's just holding on for grim death. And I said to her, I said, don't you think that bag is supposed to be like full of air and abundant and pleased with itself? And and she says, yeah, you know, I think you're right. And she was vacuum cleaning this room. And the vacuum cleaner made a decent kind of noise. But you could see that nothing was coming up off the carpet, you know. As it went over dust and pieces of paper, they just jumped up and then went back down again. <laughs> and I thought, this is not a real effective way of vacuum cleaning the carpets. And then as she was wheeling this stupid thing around, the wheel came off. And as it came off, it created this sort of very, very sort of gentle curve as it went around the carpet and sort of came into this semicircle around the other side of the room. And of course, as the wheel went around the room, it did pick up a little bit of dust on the wheel, you know, that was natural. And I looked at it and I thought, oh, this is how this vacuum cleaner works, right? <laughs> it fires little wheels that pick up microscopic bits of dust. You know, if you buy something at a discount, if you buy the cheap and cheerful, that's the only energy you'll ever have. You know, and you can go in there and you can see this vacuum cleaner and it looks neat and it's made underwater by Brazilian convicts and it only costs nine dollars. And you'll say, I take it and it has that energy. And so I would say to you, like, if your life is in control and if you're beginning to master money and beginning to feel that you will always have money, then you can begin to spend on those things that are important for you. And I would always go for the very best. I would just have less of them. 
You know, if you've only got one suit, at least have one decent suit and look good in that. So at least when you go for the interview, you come out of an energy of like, you know, I feel abundant, I act abundant, but don't go wacko, wacko, wacko and just spend a whole bunch of money. And I've watched people take on this philosophy and do exactly that and get themselves into tremendous trouble, you know. As you begin to create those feelings inside of yourself, it has to permeate your entire life. You can't have, like, let's say, one nice dress and then buy a $1.99 pair of shoes, you know, plasticky ones. And you can pretty much always tell people buy their shoes because only people that have got money spend money on shoes, you know, that buy decent shoes. So you'll get somebody that's wearing this incredible dress and then they're wearing these pair of shoes and they're like this little plasticky pair of shoes. And you can suss it out. I mean, you can say, oh, my gosh, look at that. You know. You know, if somebody comes in for an interview and they're wearing their beautifully dressed and they're wearing a decent pair of shoes, you know that that person, you know, feels good about themselves, feels strong. And of course, how much money you make is exceptionally intimately linked to how good you feel about yourself. Because it's a function of the ego to, de to devise a system for its own survival. It's a function of the ego to try to win acceptance from the people. It wants you to love it. You know, you want people to come up to you and love you. And so what happens is, as we go out into the marketplace, we have a tendency to sort of charge less or not charge anything at all, just to win people's acceptance. And that's the same thing about being sucked into what people think about us. You know, if you're not sucked into what people think about you, you just go about your life, what they think about you is their problem, not your problem, then you can begin to charge what you like for your services. And if you're coming out of energy and you're coming out of love and you're coming out of transcendence, you're basically selling a higher ideal and there isn't any limit to what you can charge. But so often you'll do an incredible job for somebody and they'll come up to you and they'll say, how much do I owe you? And you'll say, no, nah, no, nah, you know, I don't need any money, you know. I mean, how many of you have done that, you know? I mean, I watch your heads nodding, you know, yeah, no, I don't want that. And what you're sort of saying is, please love me. You know, if I do this for absolutely nothing, will you love me, you know? Or you've said, uh, yeah, I'll, you know, okay, but it should normally be $100 and just give me 20 or just give me 10 bucks and that'll be enough. And it's a way of like not feeling confident about yourself. When you give something, when you sell something to somebody, when you give them a service, when you do something for them in a commercial act, you're loving them. You're helping them. You're assisting them, you know? You're delivering this refrigerator to them and that saves them going all over everywhere and finding a refrigerator or building one themselves. You know, when you transfer goods and services to people, it's a way of loving them. And so if you love them, why wouldn't you have them love you back by giving you their money? You know, if you come out of energy and you come out of dedication and you come out of service, there isn't any limit to how much you can charge within reason. And I don't believe in, in, in rip-off or I don't believe in overcharging, but I certainly don't believe in undercharging. You know, and so many of you don't charge enough. You don't charge enough for your labor. You don't charge enough for your products because it comes out of like that self-image that says, oh gosh, I'm not really worthy for all of this. So I'm really shouldn't be charging that or they're not going to love me if I don't charge, you know, if I charge so much. But in fact, when you can see the transactions that you're involved in in life as energy, then you're not involved in the emotions of how much things cost. It's a fact of the commercial world that the more quality you put into something, the more you can charge. And at the top end of the scale, you know, you can charge anything you want. And so you're looking at trying to put energy, trying to put yourself into your commercial endeavors, whatever they might be. I mean, so often you'll go into a business, you'll go into a hotel, you'll go someplace, and the whole energy of the place is bland. You know, nobody's in it. Nobody cares. It's institutionalized. It's like press a button and this thing comes out, and you don't feel good about parting with your money. But when you're with a person that's enthusiastic, they're happy, they put their heart and soul into the product, you don't mind. You feel the life force. You feel the God force, and that inspires you. And so it almost feels like you're transferring money to another part of yourself. You know, if the other person is sort of demanding or they don't have any energy in it or they're institutional, there's a sense of loss. You think, oh, gosh, I've paid for this room, but I don't know if I really liked it, you know. It's very much a matter of putting yourself into your life, into your commercial life. And that's important. When you can subjugate your ego and put that underneath the ego of your customers or the people that are pulled to your life, then you have the ability to serve them. And that doesn't mean that you're going to lose any sense of identity inside yourself because you're not but you're going to come out of loving people by serving them. And serving them is like looking them in the eye and finding out what they want. You've got to remember that you're dealing with a person who is who's maybe scared or lonely or their body aches or they have a need or they need friendship or company or whatever they've come up for. Because what they've showed up for in your life may not necessarily be the product. 
You know, it may be some totally different reason. They've come around for healing of one kind or another. And if you can put yourself underneath them, then what happens is they feel your support. And there isn't a person out there that doesn't want to be supported, that doesn't want to feel more secure, because the name of the game out there is basically feeling insecure, feeling scared, feeling fearful about the fact that you don't necessarily control life. And so there you are. You're this confident, smiling, heroic being, and you get up underneath the person, and you come out of service. I'll never forget an incident that happened to me in Washington, D.C., where I was going into a seminar, and there was a young waiter there, and he just happened to come up to me and said, in the hotel, he said, what is the secret of tips? And I said to him, the secret of tips is to get underneath the customers, you know, to get underneath and really serve them. And he said, well, what do you mean by that? And I, mean, I, said, and I said, what I mean is that for the time it takes you to serve this person and to be with them, you'll subjugate your ego for their needs absolutely. And so rather than coming out of like thought forms of, oh gosh, when does this shift end? And look at this guy, I really don't like the way he's dressed. And oh goodness me, he's asked me for some more peanuts. And oh goodness me, I'm rushing about. What you're doing is you're coming out of, how can I help you, sir? What can I do for you? You know, would you like ice? Would you like lemon? What would you like? You know, would you like it on this side of the glass or that side of the glass? You know, would you like another pillow, another cushion? What can I get for your lady wife? What would she like? You know, there isn't anything while you're in my care that I won't do for you. You know, you want me to take your canary for a walk while having a drink no problems you know and I left this uh, this young waiter with this information about coming out of loving them and serving them and he at the, I went off and did my seminar and when I came back from the seminar it, he came up to me and he says this is totally fantastic he said I've never had a day like this ever and all the time that I've been a waiter here in this hotel and the previous record for tips in one shift for me was $42 and in this particular shift I earned $160 in tips for the very first time. So this young man had quadrupled his tips by just serving. And isn't it true, as you go out there, you'll find mediocre restaurants, mediocre hotels, mediocre airlines, mediocre everything. You know, you walk in the door and they can't even be bothered with you. They're not organized. They're not interested in what you want. You know, and you get this feeling of like, hey, I'm not a customer. I'm not a person. And you don't buy or you limit the amount you will buy. And you don't feel this expansion and this power inside of you. And so as each of you begin to look in terms of like developing a way of becoming independently wealthy or developing some kind of creativity so that it gives you more wealth, all you really have to do is serve. And serve is energy. And the people give you back another energy called money. And then you go spend that on the experiences you like, which is again energy. And I think that's vital and that to me is the key. That there isn't anything more than just coming out of service, coming out of being organized. You know, and being organized is a simple thing. You just get organized. You get, hey, what do I need to make this business work? You know, what are my customers going to want? And when you can subjugate your ego and put yourself in the mind of the customers, in the mind of the people that are going to come to you, then it isn't a problem to figure out what they're going to want. They're going to want to be comfortable. They're going to want to do it quickly or reasonably quickly, whatever it is. They're going to want it to work. They're going to want to be able to have value for money. They may want more than one way of paying for it. But basically speaking, what do they want? And then if you begin to concentrate on making it clean and fresh and beautiful, people respond. And isn't it true that as you go out in the physical plane, most of it isn't clean, isn't fresh, doesn't work, you know? I mean, you, you turn the handle, you turn the handle on the door and it comes away in your hand. You press the button in the elevator and it doesn't go any place. You put 50 cents in the Coke machine and no Coke comes out, you know? And the whole of the world is like that. It's sort of this, this only just working sort of syndrome, you know? And of course, if you move out of, say, America and you go to other places, you have even more experience of things not working, you know? So, for example, in England, whenever I travel there, I try to make all my international calls back to America before I actually leave America. Because because trying to get an international operator on the English telephone system, forget it. You can grow old. You know, you can grow old. I've only met one or two people that ever actually got through, you know. <laughs> and as you look at that, you can see how, like, so much of it doesn't work and so much of it isn't there to help you. Why is this money mastery thing so important to you? The reason it is is because we're living at a critical time in the financial history of the world today. We're looking at a banking system here today in the United States where the liquidity of these banks is on average only 6%. In the era going up to 1929, the liquidity of the average American bank fell from like 20% to 12%. And that really, really concerned people. Today, our average American bank has a liquidity of just 6%, which means that 94% or 94 cents of your dollar is no longer in that bank. 
And the money, that 94 cents that isn't any longer there, has been lent out to all sorts of folk that may or may not give it back. After the oil crisis in the 70s, in the war, in the 70s and in the war in the Middle East, the sheer amount of money that poured into the American banking system and the big financial houses of Europe and so on, that money came pouring in, the greatest transfer of wealth in the history of mankind, and the banks had to lend it out. When a bank takes your money, when it takes your deposit, that's a liability for the bank. The minute they can give it to somebody, lend it to somebody, it becomes an asset in their books. And so there's a tremendous propensity for the banks to kind of get rid of this stuff. It's almost like this hot potato that they're trying to shove onto the next guy. And so when the oil prices went up, you know, in the 70s, these banks went out and they kind of gave the money to everybody, you know. They just dolloped it out and said, hey, you need some cash, take it. And all of the countries out there of the third world and the lesser developed countries and so on, they took that money and they spent it. And they spent it like crazy on all sorts of projects that may or may not have assisted the infrastructure of those countries. And now we're looking a situation where it's tremendously difficult to get the money back from those countries. You know, America gave money to every nation in the world. I mean, just gave it. It gives it to its enemies. It gives it to its friends. Albania is the only country that America hasn't given any money to. And the only reason they haven't given any to Albania is because they can't find it. If they could find Albania, if they could find Albania, they'd give them some. You know, and so all of this money's gone out, and you can watch these third world countries struggling trying to get it back. Mexico is an excellent example where they have a debt of up around close to $100 billion. And they get about 7 or $8 billion a year in, in oil revenues. So you can see that if they're only paying, let's say, 7 or 8% interest on their money, they need all of their oil revenues every year, forever and ever, in order just to service that debt. And what happened was that when oil fell recently, you know, tumbled down from its peak of $30, $35 a barrel, we got into a situation where the American people were literally wiring money down to Mexico so it could wire it back to the bank so that nobody would default. It's like you're getting billed as a common man. You're getting billed for something that's nothing to do with you. We have a situation where, for example, corporate debt in this country is at 50% of its total assets. And a lot of the assets that the corporation have are in the form of paper and notes and bonds that they're holding of other corporations. So the 50% that you think they've got, some of that may be real money and may not be real money. The government has basically continued to print money like crazy in order to try to keep the system up. After 1946, all the major trading nations agreed to come off the gold standard, which meant that all of a sudden and money didn't have to be real anymore because in the olden days, a, a dollar bill was a receipt for some, do, for some gold someplace. And in theory, you could walk up and you could say, hey, you know, I, I want my gold, you know, or I, I want to look at my dollar bill or whatever it is you do when you go around the bank. But basically speaking, once all these, corp, all these countries came off the gold standard, there wasn't any limit to how much money the governments could create. And here in America, since 1980, the government has expanded the money supply 300%. But the country has only grown like 25 to 30 percent in that period of time. And so when you have a situation that the people that control all of the activity inside the circle can literally print money, you can see how there's a lot of money out there that really doesn't have any value at all. It's just a matter of everybody believing in it. And the banking system, everybody's got to believe in it. And that's why the common man never gets any of the information. They only get little bits of the information. Because if anybody actually told you what was actually going on, you'd freak out and you'd go get your money back. As you look at that, you can see that like personal debt has expanded to the point where like the average person owes like one and a half years wages, you know. Corporate debt is 50% of assets. The governments are running trillions of dollars worth of deficits. The trade figures are incredibly imbalanced where it's costing billions and billions of dollars every month, you know, more than they're actually taking in. And you can see that all of this is creating a strain on the financial resources, not only of America, but all of the trading nations of the world. As you see that, you can either say, well, that's great, I'm sure it'll all be all right, I'm sure it'll all be fine, or you can say to yourself, wait a minute, there's something going on here. I'm not in the possession of the facts, I can't fix what's happening in the third world, I can't fix, say, for example, that there are a record amount of, of, say, bank failures in the country right now, higher than even in that period prior to the Depression or the collapse of 1929. I can't fix that. I can't fix the business failures. I can't fix all of these scams that are going down with these various junk bonds and so on, all I can do is get in control of my own situation. If there's ever a liquidity crisis in the world, and it looks like eventually there's bound to be because we just can't carry on inventing money and spending and spending prolifically, if there's ever a liquidity crisis, cash will become king. 
You know, you'll become God if you've got cash in hand. You'll be able to go out and you'll be able to buy things for cash. Recently, near my hometown of Taos, they sold off a whole bunch of houses that had been repossessed for mortgage defaulters. And they put up 241 houses for sale all in one day. And the FHA got a whole bunch of people in for this auction to get rid of these houses because obviously they didn't want the houses. And the houses sold off in that morning. And the cheapest house sold for $400. And the most expensive house that got sold off that day was only $21,000. And you can't buy, a, you can't build a family home for $21,000. So you can see that if there's ever a cash crunch or there's ever a difficulty, if you have cash and you're liquid, you'll be in a position whereby you'll be able to go buy things that you've always wanted at half the price, a quarter of the price. You'll be in a situation of being empowered. You know, and you can pop out one day and you can spend 10 grand and you come home at night and your husband says to you, what you've been doing? You say, I've been shopping. I've got this entire street. You know, I got it. I got it from the 7-Eleven right up to the traffic light, the stop sign, you know. And I had enough, enough money in my pocket to take a limo home. You see, and some of you have saved all your life for that stuff. You're going to come into a period of time where that cash is going to be king. And the way to achieve that cash is obviously you've got to spend less than you earn. You have to have fiscal discipline. And fiscal discipline is looking at what you earn and beginning to de-escalate the debt that you have. Getting into the mastery of money is basically spending less than you earn and beginning to develop a certain amount of liquidity. Now, you may say to me, Stu, well, how do I pay off my debts and develop liquidity? The fact is that as you pay the debts, your whole energy begins to calm down. You feel less out of control and the opportunities that you need to make money will find you. But again, you have to be organized, you have to be centered, you have to know what it is you want, and you have to begin to go for it. And if you can't go for what it is you want in life just yet because you're stuck in some job here, just maintaining everything, then at least you can begin to play that fake it till you make it energy. You can begin to move towards it. You know, like if you're pumping gas in a gas station and you want to be a film director, well, you begin to resonate an intention for that. And you go to film school in the evenings and you buy books on film directing and you watch films and maybe you join an amateur filmmaking club, but you're moving towards your goal. So often people find themselves like down here and they hope that they can pull their energy up to up here, and they never make it. You have to move towards whatever it is you want, and as you move towards, it's almost like the energy comes around you and supports you to get what you want, which means that, of course, you've got to be clear about what you want. You have to have clarity. You've got to know what it is you want. And we've spoken about that in the past, have we not? But it's mostly a matter of deciding, hey, what do I want for my life right now, and what do I want later on, and what do I want later on, and concentrating on the right now. And of course, if you're not clear about what it is you want, then you begin a program of getting rid of all the encumbrances and all that stuff that's around you so that you can have what you want, so that you are clear about what you want, you know? And then you develop this high clarity about who you are, what your mission is in life, what your gift to the people is. Like, hey, what are you going to give people? You know, you're this heroic being, you understand yourself, you've got perception that other people will never have, you've got energy they'll never have, creativity that they can't even dream of, and what are you going to give them? You know, what are you going to give them when they show up? And you have to have that clear in your mind. As you develop high clarity, as you develop high resonance, which is basically moving towards your goal, resonating this intention, resonating the whole idea all of the time, bit by bit, the universal law has to give it to you. And it's only a matter of coming out of control. It's only a matter of controlling the situation, dominating the situation, and seeing what opportunities there are. In order for you to be able to be in the marketplace... You know, you have to have something that you're going to offer. And so each one of you is going to have to develop a skill or some kind of service or knowledge, or you're going to have to get into control of a product. And you've got to have something. And so often people want to make money, but they don't have anything. You know, so if you haven't got that, you're finished. You haven't got a chance. You've got to have it. It's got to be neat. It's got to be fresh. It's got to be exciting. And it's got to be there for when people show up. So like a skill would be like you're a plumber or you you do something that other people can't do and you do it for them, but you do it in an unusual and creative and exciting way. You know, and you roll up at the front door and you're in this big polystyrene bubble, you know, that looks like a sort of a a spanner or something. People say, what are you? You say, I'm the plumber and it's musical and up comes a little hat, you know, and, and... And and they think, oh, this is incredibly interesting. This is really different. Most plumbers show up in, you know, oily overalls, grumbling and moaning about how lousy plumbing is. And this guy shows up in his chicken outfit or whatever it is, you know. (laughs) 
I always had this idea of a loan package where you'd get all the details of the loan you wanted when you went to the bank, and it was this incredibly beautiful loan package, and then you would train these three canaries to sing, and when you opened up the loan package, the canaries would go, give us the loan, give us the loan, give us the loan. <laughs> you know, well, imagine the bank looking at you, and you telling them, hey, listen, what I want to do is open this flea circus, and by the way, here's these three canaries that we've taught to say, give us the loan, give us the loan. Give... You know, it's like the bank would understand you. They may not lend you the money, but they would understand the creativity. <laughs> there. So as you decide that, you've got to either have something that the rest of the world hasn't got, which is a skill, or you've got to have some kind of knowledge. And we live in the most powerful, most information conscious world that there's ever been. And there are 4.9 billion people out there and they all want to know something. You know, they want to do the courses. They want to get slim. They want to be more beautiful. They want to be more protected. They want to learn to do acupuncture for canaries or whatever they want to learn to do. And you can say, well, I happen to have this incredible course that you can do. And in fact, information transfer is now one of the major industries in the world. And so all you've got to do is either have the information or acquire it and then begin to figure out how to transfer it to other people. Of course, if you happen to be, say, for example, a lawyer, then the information you can impart, you have to do one-to-one. -one. I personally prefer information transfer where you can get a lot of information out to a lot of people without being there personally yourself. So there's videos and tapes and books and a thousand and one other ways of you transferring information to people. But if you have that information, people will pay you. And the reason they'll pay you is because they haven't got time to learn everything themselves. They haven't got time to do it all themselves. They want you to come along and tell them, hey, how's it done? So you've got the possibility of a skill, you've got the possibility of a service or, or, or knowledge, or you've got a possibility of a product. And of course, the product is by far and away the easiest way of making money, usually. Because there isn't usually any limit to how many products you can manufacture, ship, and get paid for. You know, knowledge has its limitations in many ways. A, a skill or a service has its limitations because you have to show up personally and do it. But a product has that incredible neatness that if it works for 10, it'll work for 100, it'll work for 5 million. And, you know, I've heard stories of people that have started companies that have literally made $40 million in the first nine months of the company. And they had a good product. And they got a lot of people excited about the product. And they got them selling this product to other people, serving the community, giving them this stuff. And they, and they generated 40 million in nine months from a standing start. So if you have something that is a product, you're in a position to transfer that to other human beings and get paid for it. I think the important thing to remember about a product is that it has to be something that you love, that you live and breathe. You know, if you're setting these little multi-swivel toggle flanges and you love them, great. But if you're selling something that's boring and doesn't work for you and you don't like it and it isn't quality and it doesn't honor the people and it comes out of negativity, your heart will never be in it. And isn't it true and isn't it delightful when you meet a person who's into what they do? You know, and you go in the hardware store, and I hate hardware stores. They give me the creeps just to walk in them, you know. I, I don't like do-it-yourself. I don't like fixing things. I'm lousy at that stuff. And just to walk in and all those little oily boxes, I mean, it just, ugh, it just <laughs> throws me away. And, and so if you go in there and the guy's all happy and smiling and he's the sage of the oily boxes, you feel, you feel nurtured, you know. <laughs> You feel nurtured. You feel, oh, this guy really knows. And, and you don't know. And they ask you all those dumb questions, you know, don't they? They say, well, do you need the 16th, a quarter of a 16th inch double swivel reversed diddly diddly? And you go, I don't know. You know, I just want a screw that'll hold the bathroom mirror up. Yeah, but do you want the kind that's the double bolt with a whammy jammy on it? You know, and you don't want to know. You know, you just want a guy to give you the bolt. You don't care what it costs. You haven't got time to figure it out. You don't want to do like a, you know, a four week course in, in, in little bolts. You just want a bolt. And so you feel supported. And so often we go in stores and the attendant will say to you, the shopkeeper or whatever, oh, I don't know, I just work here, you know. Does this, does this, da, 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 I don't know, you know. They don't know, they don't care, they're not interested. And I think that if you're going to be transcendent beings and you're going to serve the community by giving them something, you've got to be damn good at it. You've got to put as much energy as you feasibly possibly can. You've got to get organized. You've got to have concerted action in the marketplace. Because all the affirmations, all the visualizations, all the stuff out there, you know, the prayers, whatever which way you have, rub the little rabbit's foot, all of that stuff won't work for you unless you're out there with a concerted action plan. You love it, you live it, you breathe it, and you're happy and excited to deliver it to the people. It's simple. It's incredibly simple. Commerce is just a matter of expanding yourself to do more of it. And that expansion always comes out of control. It always comes out of controlling your environment, understanding there's no limit to how much you can charge. Well, let me ask you, how many of you are going to put your prices up next week? Let's see you.
You know, how many of you really believe in yourself? There you go, you see. And people are coming to you and they'll say, well, isn't this massage $40? Normally, you know, I understand now you're charging 80. And you say, yeah, I charge 80 this week. I feel good about myself. Next week, I feel even better. I charge 160. You know, and you begin to charge, but you put yourself in it. If you put yourself in it, they won't mind paying for it. And so, again, it's very much this whole philosophy of like pulling out of what the world says you can be, pulling out of the limitations they say you've got to be a part of, getting clear about what it is you want, resonating that intention for yourself. In other words, moving towards it, creating a clarity, creating a power around you, and heading on out. And some of you are going to have to move slowly out of, let's say, something that's restricting into this special kind of freedom that you're developing for yourself, but you begin to create it. You can begin to create it by developing, say, a hobby. There's a million of you that have various kinds of hobbies where you can make money on them. And I know guys that have converted their hobbies into multi-million dollar businesses, where there's things that you know, things that you're interested in, and you can begin to form associations and begin to meet people. You know, if you don't go meet people, then again, you create around you this limitation of not having enough people to go sell. You can have a brilliant idea, and if all you know, all you know is your auntie and your mum, you've got two customers, you know? But if you begin to understand that going and meeting people is a way of you expanding your energy, it's like saying, oh gosh, I've got this little energy, and I don't feel too confident about myself, and I don't feel too confident about this stuff, and so I won't bother to tell anybody, and that way I'll never have to, like, face the fact that I'm not really confident. But if you're good, if you're damn good, if you're coming out of love, you're coming out of service, you won't mind expanding. You won't mind traveling. You won't mind trying something new. And you won't mind going out and meeting people. You know, I tell people, listen, if you want to meet people, join churches. You know, it's a great place to meet people. You can give out your little card and the brakes, you know, pass them out in the pews. And then just join as many churches as you, <laughs> join as many churches as you can sign up for, you know. I mean, you join a Muslim church, and then you go to the synagogue on Saturday, join a couple of Christian churches on Sunday, especially those sort of open, positive, new agey type of Christian churches. You know, and then Monday you can get into some kind of wacko cult, you know, and you join them on a Monday when they have their services. And you just surreptitiously are passing out your cards, but people get to know you. Because I've watched people develop ideas that were really cute, that were really neat, and go out into the marketplace and have an initial burst of activity and then fizzle out. You know, and then, and then suddenly they're despondent and, and, and they're upset and they feel that their creativity isn't any good and they wind up going back to what they used to do because they didn't have the force or the courage to push through to like meeting people, talking to people, being with people. When you get to the point where you talk to 100,000 people a year, you've got a chance with your idea. When you get to where you talk to a million, you've got a real chance. When you get up to like 5 million, then you're really cooking, you know? When you get up to 50 million, forget it. You know, you'll have so much money, you'll have to move out of the house and get a bigger one because it's people that are going to give you the cash. And it's you feeling confident about yourself and going up to these people, presenting them with the idea and knowing that they're going to love it. And the reason they're going to love it is because you designed it for them. You designed it for the people. You didn't design it for yourself. You didn't design it for, for you know, to look cute. You designed it for the people. So you'll come up with the only bath that has faucets that work with your feet. You know, and there you go. And you suddenly say, I've had this incredible idea. For 2,000 years, they've always had these baths with these little wacko little cross-shaped faucets that you can't work with your feet. Now we've got the foot bath. And here's the, here's, the, here's the handles, and here's where you put your toe, and this is how you make it go hotter and colder. And everybody will love you. They'll say, she invented the bath faucet. She made it something, because you don't have to do anything really different. You know, you don't have to come up with some incredible laser-operated sandwich-making machine. All you've got to do... <laughs> It's come up with something slightly different, you know, and you've heard me talk about the pizza parlor where like you can have, you can be one pizza parlor in, in an entire society of pizza parlors where there's 17 in the street, but you could still make that pizza parlor so interesting that everybody's breaking their neck to come, you know, and there you are, you've got your pizza parlor and you've dug this big hole in the middle of it and you've got, let's say like a, a 20 foot drop and some alligators in there, you know. <laughs> And then you build this rickety little bridge from the front door of the pizza parlor to where the cash register is, where people order, you know? And you make this bridge so that it kind of wobbles a bit. You know, and people say, well, isn't it dangerous? And you say, yeah, we lose a few, but, <laughs> but they're hungry. When they get on the other side of this bridge, these people want the pizza, you know? They want that stuff. And the alligators, is folk drive from miles around to see these alligators. And then we're going to put a waterfall off the roof. And they're going to get a little wet coming in. But once they're in here, they've got to stay for half an hour to dry themselves out. So we'll be in this street. We'll have this waterfall off the front of the pizza. We'll have this big hole with some alligators in it. Little, little rickety bridge. And the people will feel excited. They'll feel a sense of achievement of making it across. You know, especially the older ones, you know. 
and they'll feel good about it and they buy pizza. And that's all you gotta do. And a pizza could be totally revolting. But but they're gonna buy it. In fact, if you're coming out of transcendent, you're coming out of heroic, you love yourself, you're gonna put everything you can in that damn pizza. And you're gonna make that thing wonderful. And so what you're looking at here is you're not looking at like developing some incredible plan or going to some business school necessarily. You're just looking at a shift in consciousness, a shift in dedication, understanding it's fine for you to be wealthy, understanding that you're infinite and there's no limit to how much wealth you can create for yourself. Okay? You're going to get clear about what it is you want. You're going to resonate that intention. You're going to play fake it till you make it. Whether you got it or not, you're going to move towards it no matter what. You're not going to let yourself get out of control and start spending a whole bunch of money you haven't got. Okay? You're going to allow yourself that power and that energy at all times, moving towards it, clear, resonating it, having it, being original, and more than anything else, you're going to love yourself by charging enough, okay, by giving yourself time, having patience, and you're going to love the people that are pulled to you by serving them. And if you can come out of that, 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 that love and that caring for people, putting your ego aside for their needs, your life and your business and your families will be swamped. You'll be swamped. You won't be able to handle the amount of people that show up. And as that happens, you'll have a way of billing them because you'll be organized and you'll develop wealth. And suddenly you move out of struggle into a natural understanding and a natural flow. And that's how it was always meant to be. Life was only ever meant to be this gentle walk through a valley on a sunny day. It was never meant to be this incredible struggle, this incredible effort. And each one of you has that as a heritage, and each one of you can put that into your life right here and now, today. Thank you very much. Thank you.